Coming again tonight, uh, I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. Uh, this is Wednesday night at the lab. We do this every Wednesday night 50 times a year. And on behalf of myself and the Biotech Center and the other co-organizers, which are PBS Wisconsin, the Division of Extension Wisconsin 4-H, and the Wisconsin Alumni Association, thanks again for coming tonight. And I hope to see you again soon. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce to you Jim Lattice. He's with the Department of Astronomy. He also directs UW's Space Place, which is the outreach program and facility down on South Park Street at 2300 South Park Street. And he also keeps the Washburn Observatory going, which is no easy thing to do because the Washburn Observatory was built in? 1878. 1878. It's almost as old as I am. It's the oldest really big research thing on campus, and since it was started, they've been doing public viewings yeah. every Wednesday night. Well, first and third Wednesday nights is the <clears> traditional except during the schedule, summer. except during the summer. Well, when it's that, yeah. everyone. So I cobbled Wednesday night to lab from what Jim does. Um, and so now you gotta come over here because I get to ask you a bunch of questions. Jim's going to talk with us about the North American total solar eclipse of the sun coming up on April 8th, 2024. How many people in here know Kim Carnes? All right. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I did. Delayed response. Not good. Jim, where were you born? Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. Good. And where'd you go to high school? Oldham County High School in Kentucky, which is the county where Pee Wee Valley is located. Excellent. And Oldham with an H? Uh, yes. O L D H A. O L D H A. Yeah, yeah. And then where'd you go for your undergrad and what did you study? I went to the University of Louisville where I studied physics. And where'd you go for your advanced degrees and what did you study? Well, I got a master's in physics at Louisville before deciding I wanted to be a historian of science. So I came to the University of Wisconsin where there used to be a great history of science program, now merged into the history department. There are still good historians of science on the, on the campus. So I got my PhD here. Very good. And have you been here ever since? Uh, I did some dissertation research in Italy and then I had a postdoc in Italy, so I've spent a couple of years abroad. Was that in Rome or Florence? Rome. Or Entirely Rome. in Rome, yeah. Yeah, uh, I did not go to Rome to study, <laughs> but I wish I had. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. I was in Rome in 2017 when we had the hmm. solar when eclipse. When we had the eclipse here? Yes. Yeah. I'm genius. <laughs> uh, so I'm looking forward to being able to be here on April 8th of 2024. Would you please join me in welcoming Jim Lattice to Wednesday night at the lab. Well, thank you. Um, as Tom said, um, I am director of the UW Space Place, and we do programs down there as well, although not as frequently as, as Tom does. We have uh, guest speakers on the second Tuesday of each month. And uh, then we have a talk about what's currently happening in the sky on the third Friday of each month. So I know, and then Washburn Observatory is first and third Wednesdays. That's, uh, at any rate, uh, you can find though our, our schedule at spaceplace.org. So I will leave it um, at that. Oh, except to say that those guest speakers, sometimes I insert myself into the schedule uh, when I feel like I have something I ought to talk about. And so actually I'm the guest speaker in July and I'm gonna be giving this talk. So you don't have to come unless you really like it. Um, so Tom uh, suggested that we needed to have a, a talk about the upcoming solar eclipses. So there are two interesting solar eclipses coming up. The total one there that, that Tom mentioned on um, uh, next uh, April next year is uh, uh, pretty interesting and we'll talk about that. But there is another significant eclipse coming up and that's, late, and that's later this year in October. So those are the two, uh, the two that we'll talk about. I wanna get the basics out of the way first and then I'll talk a little bit more about why we have eclipses and what some of their characteristics are. 
But let's just jump right in and say uh, this eclipse later this year in October is um, an annular eclipse, so not a total eclipse. The annular eclipses, there you see one in progress in the upper right there, the annular in an annular eclipse, the moon is a little bit too far away from us to completely cover the disk of the sun. So there's a ring there of the, of the photosphere, the actual surface of the sun there, and there's, if there's any of the photosphere showing at all, then you don't see the corona, which is the, the site that, that uh, the, sort of the payoff for uh, seeing a total solar eclipse. So the, the ring, though, is where the name comes from. It's a, 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 an, an annulus, a ring. And so the annular eclipse um, <clears throat> will uh, be, you can see the path there. In fact, let me uh, advance to the, uh, the there's, make it a little bit bigger there. You see the red, uh, the red path. Let's see, does my pointer, yeah, there you go. That's the path of, you can't call it totality for an annular eclipse. You could call it annularity, I guess. It's, that's the path along which the alignment is central. So both a total solar eclipse and an annular solar eclipse have in common that uh, they are central eclipses. The center of the sun, if you're in the path, the center of the, the, sorry, the center of the moon crosses the center of the sun. Otherwise, you get a partial eclipse, and, and that's and of course, with all of these, you get partial phases beginning and, and afterwards as well. So uh, this one is uh, for us in Wisconsin. Um, you, you're going to have to travel. Well, it's really the case with, uh, with any of these here. And you can see this one starts. It's coming. The, the path is going there from uh, upper left to lower right. So just across the continental U.S., it comes in sort of over the Pacific Northwest there and crosses uh, down then and through Texas, if you just want to stay in the, in the central, uh, in the continental U.S., although the point of maximum eclipse is down there in Central America where the little, the little, uh, the little green uh, star, or sun, maybe that is, um, is, crossing, is crossing down there. So you can be anywhere along this uh, path here and see the entire annular eclipse on um, October 14th uh, coming up this year. So what would that look like? Well, um, we'll see um, the partial phases, and then we'll see the annular right at the beginning there. These sorts of things are actually, um, there, there's maybe one good thing about an, well, they're interesting uh, in any case, and it's, it's Right around the, the middle of the eclipse, uh, sunlight is really darkened, you know, really uh, weakened, uh, and you get some interesting effects on the ground and things like that, but you can see them through clouds. Uh, if the sun can shine through the clouds, then you see the whole eclipse. You don't, the way you'd miss a total eclipse, a uh, cloud cover will, will uh, disrupt. You won't see the total, you know, if the cloud cover is enough, you won't see the total phase, you won't see the corona. So. Um, so maybe you want, if they're a little more weather, weather independent, not a whole lot, but a little more than a total, uh, a total solar eclipse. Um, what will that look like if you're, uh, if you're not willing to travel? I, I put in a few, I, I got a few times here. You can go to a website that I'm going to refer to several times here, this one, eclipsewise.com. And uh, it will, you select an eclipse and then you can select a, a table of, uh, locations, and then you can go down and find uh, a lot of data as uh, calculated for that specific location. So I just, just to give you a, a rough idea of what's, uh, what we're seeing here, in Madison, uh, these are gonna, this is quite a convenient hour here. The maximum eclipse is right around noon, uh, and it'll be a little over magnitude, uh, a little more than, than half. That's the fraction of the sun's diameter that's covered by the, the moon. So a little more than, so 57 or 54 uh, percent, 50, almost 55 percent of the diameter. That's not the surface area, that's the linear diameter across the, across the, um, the sun there. So around noon, and you can see that for a number of other cities here, I mean, if you're in any of these cities, you can take a quick snapshot of this, but you can also just go to EclipseWise here. But you can see that it's, uh, across the Midwest, it's pretty much um, um, pretty much all the same there, but I did want to throw in uh, one city that's on the t path of totality. So I just chose Santa Fe, and uh, uh, they're of course west of us, so it's all going to happen a little bit earlier than it than it happens here. And then there's an hour because they're in the mountain 
uh, time zone there. Uh, so they will get the annular phase there, and the, um, the annular phase will last uh, not quite three minutes, two minutes, 52 seconds. So you can generate these kinds of numbers for anywhere in the, at least in the US, uh, with a map that I'll show, an interactive map on the web that I'll show you a little bit later. You can just click anywhere you want and generate uh, these, kinds of, uh, these kinds of numbers. So if you do know where you're going to be during this eclipse and you want to find out what the local details are, that's, it's actually pretty easy to do. All right, so that's the upcoming annular eclipse, but the total eclipses are the, uh, the, real, the real spectacle. And only a few, um, only a small fraction of people have personally experienced the total solar eclipse, but I have, I have yet to talk to, I, I've talked to a number of people who said, well, I didn't think it mattered, we were gonna be at 98%, so why go to the, to the trouble, but I'm glad I did. Uh, n nobody is ever sorry that they, that they went out of their way to see a total solar eclipse. The uh, experience of it, how many of you have been to a total solar eclipse, been in the path of totality? Okay, so quite more, than I would have, more than I would have thought. Um, the experience is uh, like nothing else that you'll experience on the Earth, this alignment of celestial bodies that reduces the sun then to the state that otherwise we, we never see. Um, shadows get odd. And, 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 and uh, unless you're looking for that, you just get this odd feeling that maybe your glasses aren't quite right or something, but it's the light. It's the light as the edges of shadows go weird when the, when the sun is no longer it's a disk, but is a funny um, sort of shape. And you begin to see waves of, waves of light in the, in the surrounding as the shadow of the moon approaches. And you can, if the weather conditions are right, if it's nice and clear, you can see the shadow of the moon coming up off on the horizon. It's dark over there, like a, almost like a dark cloud, uh, except it's approaching fast. And then it starts to get dark. Stars and planets appear in the sky, and then the corona uh, pops out when the photosphere is totally, um, uh, totally blocked and you um, have a few minutes or whatever the time is. Actually, the one in uh, next April is gonna be pretty generous with time, not a record. Uh, and um, we get a little bit of time with the corona and then all of a sudden, that first little disc of the photosphere that appears there and poof, the corona is gone just like that. And uh, uh, we're, we're back to basically running the film in reverse now of the upcoming stages of the eclipse as it, as it runs out. You see the, the dark shadow rush off to the horizon, in the case of the one in April, off to the northeast, because that's how the path is, is going. And, um, and then you're all wishing you could see it again. And that's, that's when a lot of people start looking and saying, well, where's the next one? Where can I go see the next one? So that can be habit forming. Well, the last one, and um, I'm gonna guess a lot of you, that when you raised your hands there, maybe you've seen more than one, but uh, the, the, the last one was August of uh, 2017. Um, if you didn't go to the path of the eclipse, and of course you saw the, 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 partial, the partial phases, but trust me, it's worth the trouble if you can manage it. Uh, we're not gonna have another one in the continental US for a few years after, uh, after this one, although there are other ones uh, that you can travel to if you wanna travel the world. It is happening in April. So, as I say up there, we're sort of at the mercy of springtime weather. Uh, and I'll talk just a little more about that here when we're looking at the path. So this is the path now on that same projection uh, from that same website. Um, by the way, uh, you will see this guy's name, Fred Espinek. Um, uh, Fred Espinek worked, uh, he's retired, but he spent his career at NASA calculating uh, solar system phenomena, planetary alignments, and all that kind of stuff. And so eclipses are something he's been doing for quite a long time. He's retired now, but he operates this uh, website. Here it is up here, eclipsewise.com. And I would say that's probably ought to be your first choice. There are other good sources for things, but one-stop shopping, that's a good, that's a good place to go to. Uh, his uh, Fred Espinek site, eclipsewise.com. So here we are. This is our total solar eclipse. 
He makes these lines blue for total. The other one, you might have noticed the path was red. That's because it was annular. So when you're looking at these charts, you can quickly sift out uh, which ones are which. Uh, and the partial phases of the eclipse are, are indicated by these contours. Of course, as you get away from the eclipse line, uh, uh, it, it's, it's more and more partial. Um, so to speak, but you can see the eclipse as a phenomenon, as a partial eclipse, is visible all across the, the continental U.S., not Alaska, uh, but, and, and not, well, actually some in, some in Hawaii, oops, some in Hawaii, but um, uh, the path, un unlike the uh, annular that, that did sort of this, from northwest to southeast, and that was very roughly what the 2017 one did as, as well, sort of came west west to east, west to southeast. Um, but this one is, is going the other way, uh, southwest to northeast. And again, the maximum eclipse in this case is in Mexico. The other one there was down in Central America. Um, but we get a pretty good shot at it from Texas across here right up into the Great uh, Lakes. And um, so this is a uh, one to seriously consider um, getting to. And we ought to look at some times uh, here for, for this one. So again, if you don't want to leave Wisconsin, then here are just some times to give an indicator. It's not happening at dawn or at dusk or anything. That other one was right around noon for us. And this one in our time zone here's maximum eclipse is right around 2 p.m. Um, so uh, then I chose one city on the path of totality, again, just to get a rough idea here. So in Buffalo, New York, where it'll be total for three minutes and 45 seconds, so almost four minutes. That's pretty respectable for these, as these things go. Um, there, there is, um, I've seen them as long as like seven minutes, but that's pretty unusual for the totality to last that long. This is actually pretty generous. Uh, and uh, again, the maximum eclipse there a little bit after 3 p.m., uh, 3.20 or so in Buffalo, uh, New York. Again, you can generate these numbers yourself uh, at eclipsewise.com. Um, All right, well, let's talk a little bit about the basics. So I wanted to get those nuts and bolts. If you just want to know some times and dates and things like that, that's what uh, that first part was about there. When we get a total solar eclipse, that's the moon getting in the way of the sun. And so here you have a rough not to scale um, diagram uh, of this showing the shadow of the moon falling on the earth there. And we talk about two parts of the shadow of the moon. If you're in this inner part of the shadow, which is called the umbra, then you're in a location where the moon's disk is totally blocking the sun. So that's where it's total. It's total there in the umbra. And if you're enough off to the side that you see some sun and the moon is just, just cutting off part of the solar disk, then that's you're in the partial area and that's in the penumbra. So if you're in the penumbra, you're seeing the um, partial, uh, some amount of the partial phase of the eclipse. And of course, if you're outside of both of those, then you don't see anything. You don't see the moon uh, cross in front of the sun at all. Not to scale, but this one is to scale. The umbra, is really, really small on the Earth's surface. Varies a little bit, but it's just maybe 100 miles wide. So it's a very narrow strip. That's that narrow strip that Espinex diagrams uh, were showing you. But the reason that's so narrow is that uh, the moon here casts a very small shadow, the umbra, the darker part. Can you see that? Yeah, right in the middle there on the, uh, on the Earth. Um, the moon is about uh, 30 Earth diameters away. So again, just to keep this, just to give you some idea of the scale, the moon is about 30 Earth diameters away from the Earth. The sun is about 400 times farther away than the moon. So where is the sun on this diagram? Well, it's off this way, 400 times that distance there. So pretty far, pretty far away out there. The sun is a lot bigger than the moon, but because of the um, lucky coincidence that the sun is about 400 times larger than the moon and 400 times farther away. They both have the same angular diameter on the sky. So the, the moon has a, if you think about, people often overestimate the angular size of the moon. If you try to imagine what, 
what would I hold out there to block the moon? You might think, well, could, a, could a quarter do it? Well, yeah, a quarter would easily do it. Would a dime do it? Yeah, easily. A, a, a blueberry or something like that would be about the right size, held at, arm, at arm's length. So the moon is uh, pretty tiny up there in the sky. The sun has roughly the same angular size, so they can overlap and produce a total solar eclipse. But they don't do it every time. And I'll show you a diagram in a middle, uh, in a moment. Um, so when they, when they do line up center to center, then we get a central eclipse, either an annular or a total. If the alignment isn't just right, then you get a partial. Lots and lots of solar eclipses. The umbra just misses the surface of the Earth, but a good chunk of the Earth can see the, 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 the penumbra. So then it's only partial from uh, anywhere, on the, uh, anywhere on the Earth. So when you do see this solar eclipse happening, there are other things to watch for besides the um, appearance of the corona itself. There are, the, the, um, this, um, this unusual circumstance that the sun is no longer a disk illuminating the earth, but instead is some fraction of a disk is the thing that gives shadows and other lighting effects the, 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 the weirdness that we feel. And if, you're, if you watch in the right circumstances, it happens at the edges of lots of sorts of things, but you can actually see it happening in places like um, uh, a light under a tree or something along that line where the, the, the uh, uh, spacing of leaves in the tree are creating, in effect, pinhole images on the ground. And that's what you see here. Each of those, this is, uh, I'm not sure what's, what's above, some kind of a tree or something above, but this is the, the pavement in front of the tree there, and each one of those is an image of the sun. So you can see there that it's a, it's a partial phase. That pinhole effect is uh, one of the weird things that happens in the, in the lead up to a solar eclipse. Another thing that happens is, is something called shadow bands, and here you have, they're a little bit hard to illustrate. <clears throat> There's a number of things about solar eclipses that are dynamic. And so just taking a photo of one doesn't really give you a real clear idea of it. Um, the, 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 the shadow bands are, are analogous to like the twinkling of stars. And the twinkling of stars is a result of our atmosphere, not anything about the star. So when we, when we look up there at a star, we're seeing a point image but the atmosphere is unstable. The column of atmosphere that we're looking at has denser and, uh, and, and areas of varying density along the way, which is deflecting the starlight in, in ways. And as those relationships change, we see the star dance around, get brighter and dimmer. A similar thing happens then with the sun just before totality and it produces these uh, shimmering uh, bands of what are called shadow bands that stretch. They're not really shadows. They are varying degrees of um, solar light that are refracted by the uh, Earth's atmosphere just as the sun is become, just as the surface of the sun, not, not nice and big. When it's nice and big, it come, it, there are many paths through the atmosphere. But as the sun is reduced to a tiny little sliver, then the path is restricted and it's more like the starlight and you get this, this, uh, at these atmospheric effects. So the shadow bands shift and propagate across the surface. Um, and if you don't make a point to look at them, then that's another case where you just get this kind of subliminal fe feeling that there's something weird about the light going on. Uh, but here somebody has laid out a white uh, a sheet or something and uh, captured a, a moment in the shadow bands as they, as they shimmer and progress. Uh, across there. So these are the sorts of things that give you the weird sort of feeling followed then by the appearance of the corona, which is similarly uh, very dynamic in appearance. You can't really um, tell that, although this is a really good, as still photos go, this is a really fine one. Um, photographic film could never really capture this, but digital imaging can do this now. You can see the, the dynamic range in here. I hope the lights aren't too um, strong on there. But you can see the fine structure in the, in the corona. And you can also see the, these uh, uh, prominences here, right on the edge of the sun, being covered by the disk of the moon. And I don't think you can see that from here. But the digital imaging can even pull out 
lunar features, the dark side of the moon that's facing us right there, the imaging is pulling that out. You don't see that with the eye, at least I don't. Um, but the, the photography brings that out. So this fine structure in the, in the corona is, you, can, you see that with your eye and it's, and it's dynamic, in part because of the uh, atmosphere, that same, the same atmospheric stuff that's going on uh, that produces the, the shadow bands. You, you tell me, yeah. Okay. So, we await the totality and then we get it for a, a, a few minutes there. Well, we don't get these very often, well, depending on your, your idea of often. Um, the, we, we get these solar eclipses at new moon, when the moon moves between us and the sun, and we get a new moon every lunation, so basically um, every month. Uh, we also get lo lunar eclipses when the moon is around this side and passes, it's not shown here, but the earth casts a shadow there, and when the full moon passes through the shadow, there we get a lunar eclipse. So that happens also every lunation, basically every month. But we don't get eclipses uh, at every one of those because the earth's uh, uh, sorry, because the moon's orbit, which is this green circle right here, is not aligned with the Earth's orbit, but is tipped by about five degrees. And so here it's showing the moon, this is not to scale again, the sun and the moon and the shadow on the Earth. And so the Earth's orbit and the moon's orbit have to have intersected in just the right way for that shadow to reach the Earth. If, here you can see the orbit is, this is trying to show the orbit going beneath, the moon's orbit going beneath the orbit of the Earth, and over here above the orbit of the Earth. So it's tipped up on the right side, so to speak. So if the, if this, uh, if the moon were in this part of the orbit, when this alignment, namely new moon, happens, then the shadow would overshoot the Earth, wouldn't reach the Earth's surface. So it can only happen at what are called the nodes, which are the places where the, uh, the two planes, the two orbits, um, intersect. So there's one on each side, one on the, near si on the sun side, and one on the far side. There are two nodes. So if the moon is near a node when it is uh, also full, then there's a chance of a solar eclipse. And if the moon is near a node when it's near full moon, then there's a chance of a lunar eclipse. And um, despite our experience that solar eclipses seem rare, they're about equally common, lunar and solar um, eclipses. The big difference is that a lunar eclipse, when it occurs over here on this side, is visible by everybody on that side of the Earth. We all see them if we're on the right side of the Earth. So a whole hemisphere of the Earth sees the lunar eclipse. Over here, the solar eclipse, we only see it if we're there in that little spot there. So despite the fact that there are roughly two a year of each kind, um, nevertheless, uh, we don't see the, the, the solar eclipses. They, they feel rare um, to us. Okay, so those alignments there, those two nodes, the one on the sun side and the one on the anti-sun uh, side. Um, when the Earth is at the right place in the orbit for that alignment to happen, that's called an eclipse season. And so if you get, but, but then you still have to have the, a full moon or a new moon, new moon for the solar eclipse, a full moon for the lunar eclipse, happen during that time when those things are lined up to, to get one, and that happens twice a year, one, uh, roughly six months apart. So we have these two eclipse uh, seasons um, per year. And typically what happens is the moon, the moon is moving in its orbit uh, and the Earth is moving in its orbit. And so there's this period of time when the moon can be at a point to produce an eclipse. But it doesn't move so fast that in two weeks later, the alignment isn't still fairly uh, close enough. Uh, and so the typical pattern is that if you get one good central, either lunar or 
solar eclipse, then two weeks before or two weeks after, you'll get a poorly aligned of the, of the other kind. Um, and so if you look, for example, at these two upcoming solar eclipses, if you look in Espinex tables, he does lunar eclipses too. So the one that's going to be on the 14th of October, um, there's a lunar eclipse two weeks later, but it's not a very good one. It's poorly aligned lunar eclipse, so most people won't really bother to, uh, to, to go out and, and look for it, but that's because the, the alignment is really good there at the solar eclipse. And then the same thing happens um, uh, over here two weeks earlier on the 25th of March. There's a poor lunar eclipse that precedes then the really good solar eclipse on, uh, uh, in April, on the 8th of April, the one that we're talking about here. So there are these what are called conjugate eclipses here, in each case accompanying the solar eclipses that we're also talking about. They each have their, their, their uh, conjugate uh, lunar eclipse. So again, we get about two of these a year, and uh, it's the, 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 um, they're, they're equally common, lunar and solar eclipses, uh, but the, the, the perception that it's uh, uncommon is because what's uncommon is to be in the eclipse. Uh, most, of the, uh, uh, most of the total eclipses, the umbra passes uh, somewhere inconvenient, like over the Arctic areas or out over the oceans. Uh, of course, these days there are lots of cruises that will happily sail you out to be in the, the eclipse path. Um, but the, the ones that occur then over populated areas, like across the continental U.S., they feel, the, the, uh, um, they feel uncommon because we're seldom in the right place uh, to see them. So you have to travel if you want to do this. This is where I want to mention, I'm not going to pull it up right here. We could, uh, we could certainly do that if anybody wants to try it. Uh, the, you can go to Fred Espinek's site, to eclipsewise.com, and again, uh, he's got this um, table you can find that lists major U.S. cities. It's quite a long list. I don't know how many are on there, but Madison is on there, for example. Um, but the interactive map is up here, eclipse2024.org, and it's quite a good one as, as well. Um, if, you, if you go to eclipse2024.org, then you can click either uh, inside the path or outside the path on any arbitrary spot. So if you've got somebody who's got a farm in northern Minnesota or whatever, it doesn't have to be a city. You just click there, and it will pop up uh, information this way. I clicked here on Madison. Um, and uh, so it's telling us about the location where I clicked, right there on Madison. And then it's a view eclipse data for your selected location. So I didn't click on that, but if you click on that, it will take you then to a very similar sort of um, uh, summary of information, those, the times when the uh, various stages of the eclipse will, will happen. All right, well, um, hoping that you're all going to go to some trouble to try to see this solar eclipse, whether you travel to the path of totality or not, um, I need to address some safety tips, of course. Um, you never look at the sun directly. I'm sure you'd know that already. Um, you need to employ that rule. Don't look at the sun all the time, not just during eclipses, right? Eclipses are not especially dangerous or anything along that line. It's just that you're looking at the, you're looking at the sun. Um, during totality, the light from the corona is safe for the unaided eye. And so what we're typically doing is watching the partial phases through solar filters or by projection, which, and I'll show us some examples of that in a moment, but um, some safe method of observing these partial eclipses right up until the moment of totality. And then you can either take off your eclipse glasses or put down your projection apparatus and you can look up at totality. If you've been to an eclipse, then you Usually the way it works is that um, somebody there in the party knows the total time that totality is going to last and starts a stopwatch then because you don't want to be looking at the sun 
just at that moment when the photosphere pops back out again because you can't really react fast enough and you'll be seeing spots for a little while. You'll look away pretty fast once it happens, but you'll, you'll, um, you're risking some eye damage there. So if somebody's running the stopwatch and counting it down, three, two, okay, now everybody look away or put on your glasses again, and then the, uh, the corona disappears uh, at that point. Um, the... Um, uh, and then, then let, me, let me just note that, as I've said, eclipses, it's dangerous to look at the sun anytime, eclipse or not. Uh, don't let anybody be confused, though. Lunar eclipses, even though they are eclipses, they are not, uh, they're not in any sense uh, dangerous. You're not looking at the sun at all. You can't even because it's up at night. So no eye protection necessary for uh, lunar eclipses, but be careful with solar eclipses. Generally, these days, it's pretty easy to acquire some proper solar filters, which are, are mass-produced. I think, I think we had them for two bucks a piece for the 2017 one. Uh, we're we're uh, uh, going to be ordering some. We, I mean, Space Place and the Astronomy Department um, for uh, the upcoming eclipse. And um, there'll be a lot of, there's already lots of places that you can buy them uh, online, buy lots of pairs. So uh, get those. Uh, well in advance, but only use proper solar filters. <clears throat> you can use dense welding glass, and people have done that. Uh, that makes the sun um, a kind of unnatural bluish color, which some people don't like. But if your welding glass is dense enough, I should have looked it up. I think number 14 is what they recommend. Uh, you can do that. The color is kind of arbitrary. It's just a question of how they make the filter, and people like to think of the sun as kind of yellow-orangish, and so they make these filters so that the, so that the color balance comes through um, that way. It's not a, a, a question so much of, of what you use as what's, what's convenient and, and handy and inexpensive, and the solar filters these days, there's no reason not to, uh, not to use those. Uh, in the old days, when that kind of thing wasn't so easily available, you would see various sorts of recipes for um, a neutral density filter made of stacking up lots of sunglass lenses or smoked glass. People would use smoked glass or um, exposed photographic film, dense photographic film, things like that. None of that is a good idea. You have no control in those cases over the uh, radiation outside of the visible. You may, you may dim the light enough to make it comfortable in the visible, but you won't know how much infrared or, or UV might be leaking through there. So, and, the, and these, uh, these uh, mass-produced solar filters are so convenient that there's no reason not to use those. Um, you don't have to really spend even any money, even though those solar filters are pretty cheap. You can get away with uh, things that cost almost uh, nothing by using the same, that same uh, effect that we saw in the leaves of the trees. So here's the here are pinhole images of the sun. You can make your own pinhole imagery, uh, imager. There's, there's uh, many, many, many ways um, uh, to do this. And so you just, the fundamental idea is, is, is a pinhole and something to project it on. Um, experimenting with pinhole materials and sizes and things like that uh, is, um, uh, you, you might have to do that depending on just what effect you're going for. But here's an example of a somewhat more elaborate do-it-yourself. We uh, uh, had some kids doing this at the last, at the 2017 uh, solar eclipse because the, they, they have fun cutting out the boxes and uh, but this is a, a pinhole viewer here. You put a screen, you have your, sort of your own little eclipse projector with a, a screen there to, um, uh, for the pinhole image. And the pinhole's over here. And if you make a nice clean uh, pinhole and a piece of aluminum foil, you'll get a nice clean image over here. The smaller the pinhole, the nicer the edge on the image, but the dimmer the image. The larger the pinhole, the fuzzier the image, but the brighter the image. So that's why you experiment a little bit. Uh, maybe even have uh, two or three of them. So this is just one of many, many ideas of doing this kind of thing for, for making your own eclipse uh, projector at uh, um, extremely low cost. So I'll wrap up here by giving you some eclipse resources. And uh, both of the 
well-known astronomy magazines, Astronomy and Sky and Telescope, will be carrying stuff. They probably already have stuff on their websites, which are given uh, right here. But their issues will be carrying in the months uh, leading up to this event. Uh, they'll be carrying lots of, uh, lots of information about those things. Of course, there's lots of good websites these days. Um, and I don't even know what's going to crop up between now and next, uh, next April. There'll probably be some other good ones. So I just occasionally will, will Google for things like this to try to turn up any interesting sites. But, um, but these are the ones that are worth, um, they're always there and they're easily worth looking for. NASA runs this Eclipse website here from Goddard Space Flight Center, and that's the one that uh, Fred Espinek uh, used to do. In fact, I think Fred still does it, but then runs his own there at EclipseWise.com. I found a nice one here called Great American Eclipse, which uh, they set up for that last one, for the 2017 one, and I wasn't sure whether, but I checked it, and they've, they've updated it now for the, for the next one, and it's a pretty good site too. Uh, and then there's uh, this one once again. This is the same one, the interactive map that I gave you earlier, uh, eclipse2024.org. That'll go right to it, and then you can uh, um, uh, um, find your way in to the state map. But this also take you. This URL will take you straight to the um, to the app. So. Start laying your plans for these two uh, eclipses. The next total solar eclipse after um, the one next year, 2024, after April, will cross North Africa in August of 2027. So again, you'll have to, you'll have to travel uh, to get out there, although there's a good chance of a clear day there, unlike the one in April, maybe. We'll have to see. Um, I forgot to mention that if you, uh, you can find, I didn't think to put it in here, you can find uh, on the web, you can find summaries of climatological records that tell you how likely it is for you to get a clear day at a given point, really any point in the U.S. And if you start looking along, here's the 2024, the April next year, the blue line here. Um, <coughs> you find that you're more likely to get a clear day, like maybe uh, three days out of four in early April. If you're down here in West Texas, around say El Paso or out in that area there, and your chances decline significantly here in the Ohio River Valley where they get lots of springtime exciting weather right through there. And by the time you get up here into the Northeast, it's more like two days out of three are typically clear. So um, it's, uh, of course, it's, uh, the, the, if you're really determined to see the eclipse, then you lay your plans uh, and um, you're ready to hop in your car and drive to whatever site along the path. But uh, boy, that can be, a, that can be quite, a, um, uh, quite a logistical <coughs> process if you want to, uh, quite, uh, logistically challenging if you want to try to do something like that. But your chances are better here in the southwest, just looking at the weather statistics, than going up here into the Ohio River Valley and up into the, north, into the northeast. Um, I might be going to Buffalo, New York anyway for entirely other reasons, so I may just be staking it all on, on a clear day in Buffalo, New York than in April. So that's the next total solar eclipse. And then if you want to just wait here in the US, wait for another one to cross the mainland US, then you can do that. And the next one of those will be in August of 2044. So only, only 20 years down the, down the road from, from next, year's, next year's eclipse. So uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions. If you Sarah. Uh, I know you work at Washburn. I was just wondering if uh, Washburn has any, ever done any research on eclipses in its very long history. Um, not at the Washburn. Yes. Repeat the question. Oh, sorry, sorry. The question was, has Washburn Observatory done any eclipse research over its, over its long history? Uh, Washburn ab astronomers certainly have. Um, and... Um, in the, well, let's see, starting, well, 
Uh, the earliest one I can think of is the, 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 the eclipse in 1900 that crossed the U.S. And um, at least one Washburn astronomer toted a telescope down to, that one crossed in the um, sort of the southeast U.S. I think he went to Georgia or somewhere along in there. Um, and, oh, and before that, actually, yeah, and a more interesting one, 1883, there was a total solar eclipse that crossed out through the Pacific, and um, the U.S. actually mounted an expedition to go out there that was um, led by uh, Edward Holden, who was the director of Washburn Observatory then. Um, and he went out there largely to look for the uh, suspected planet Vulcan. So he was, he, was, he was Vulcan searching out there. And that continued to be a preoccupation for not just Washburn astronomers, but a lot of them, uh, until the um, really almost 1920 or so. Well, anyway, uh, let's see. So right, 1900, I know they uh, at least one astronomer, Washburn astronomer. I don't know what he was doing, probably looking for Vulcan. And then um, it, there's quite a series of them starting in uh, 1923, I think it was. And then there's, there's, there's a, a series of them that were, uh, had as their goal the photo. Those were the, the days when Washburn astronomers were developing photoelectric photometry, and, which was a, a, a local specialty that was practiced almost nowhere else. And so they were doing cutting edge science almost no matter what they did. And one of the things they did was use the, um, their photometric methods to look at the light of the corona at different eclipses and to see if they could detect variations in that that were related to the sunspot cycle, the, the 11 year um, sunspot cycle. So they went to a series of eclipses in the 20s and 30s uh, doing photometry on the um, corona, and if I remember correctly, they didn't find significant variation, at least not variation that corresponded with the, but nobody had ever done that before. You have to look to find out. And so um, and the, I know there was one in the 50s that crossed northern, I think it was in the 50s, that crossed northern Wisconsin, and uh, a little team from Washburn Observatory went up there. I'm not entirely sure what they were doing, but I know they went, they went up there for that one as well. Um, so yeah, so there have been a string of them. I haven't, I, in, in the days, as I say, I'm not sure what they were doing since the 1950s into the, into the 60s and afterwards. Um, there really haven't been many, if any, UW astronomers whose specialty has been solar research. And so there hasn't been a lot of motivation for actual scientific expeditions uh, uh, based here. So I guess, yeah, so I guess the big activity there was in the 20s and, 20s and 30s, and the, interest, the really interesting science was what they were doing with the early uh, photoelectric photometry uh, methods there. Thank you. Certainly. Other questions? Else? Sorry. With the viewing, um, if you go to a place where it says it's like 98% versus right in the umbrella, is that a different, like, should you just drive the extra 50 miles, or is it basically? It's what I'd do, yeah. Yeah. Can you repeat um, that? Right. I, I, ha I have talked to people who said, well, we thought, you know, we were close, and so why, uh, why, why bother? But we're glad we, we're glad we did. Uh, Oh yeah, right. So any uh, any amount of the photosphere that's still visible, and you won't see the you won't see the corona, um, and it'll also um, it'll go by really fast just at, at that at that moment. So you get a brief when it, when it's fairly dark, but you don't see the corona. You just see this little sliver of sun, and then it starts to come back again. So um, yeah, if you're if you're at ninety eight percent, you definitely ought to drive on into the eclipse path. The, if you want to maximize your experience, you want to be near the center of the eclipse path. The, as you get off of the center line, the amount of time of totality decreases um, quite a bit. So you can be just inside of the edge of it, and you'll, you'll see uh, the uh, totality. But it, uh, if you're gonna, again, if you're going to go to that trouble, yeah, drive the extra 30 miles. Uh, it can be a problem because that doesn't, there's not necessarily a road that you can follow that goes right <laughs> to the center line, right? So planning. Uh, planning is a big is a big deal. Do you know if the 2017 eclipse or any other 
re good reality experiences you can obtain and uh, or whatever it's called. Oh, in for that difference between five percent percent. Uh, I don't know about that uh, uh, as, as uh, in terms of those VR um, things. I, that there ought to be, but I don't know. There are th some of these websites. I'm pretty sure that Eclipse 2024, when you click on a place, it will generate a little animation. But that's on the screen to give you a little preview of what you would see there, whether whether it be a not quite total or a quick totality or the full treatment if you're towards the center line. But I don't know of the of any VR stuff. There, Probably is some, but I'm not aware of it. Other questions? Um, why would they be thinking they could see the planet in the eclipse that they wouldn't otherwise be able to see yeah. six months later when this is on the other side? Yeah, because, uh, because Vulcan, if it existed, would always be very close to the sun, like just as Mercury is. So Mercury never gets more than 20 odd degrees away from the sun because its orbit is small. We're outside of it. We're looking over there, and Mer Mercury goes as it orbits uh, goes east and west okay. of the sun. An interior. Yeah, yeah. So Vulcan would have been the theory was the the, the problem was that um, Mercury's orbit. Um, the predictions of the position of Mercury never quite worked even after the celestial mechanics specialist had taken into account every influence in the solar system they could think of. You know, is it Neptune tugging it or what? You put in everything you can think of and it still doesn't quite fit. And so the theory was maybe there's an un yet unknown planet, an unknown influence, and the only place that could really be would be closer to the sun. That would be a good place to hide a planet because if it were closer than Mercury, we might never have seen it, and it, then it could influence Mercury. So the theory was that that was there. That's a whole uh, another talk entirely, but it was there were there were good reasons to think that um, that that was a, a profitable approach. In part because the planet Neptune had been discovered exactly that way, that is by unexplained influences on Uranus, and so then you go look for that influence and you find a planet, you find Neptune. So now we have unexplained influences on Mercury. Theory is that there's another planet there. People had actually thought that they saw, there had been reports, I should put it that way, that, uh, that, 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 um, that some astronomers had, had witnessed a, a disk crossing the disk of the sun, a, a small spot moving across the sun. Um, so it was uh, it was quite a quite a process there from the 1870s right on into the early 1900s to wait for a total solar eclipse and look for that. Famously, the first director of Washburn Observatory, James Watson, thought that he had a method that would allow him to see it without waiting for a solar eclipse, and. Those of you who know anything about the history of the Washburn Observatory, there was a the Watson Solar Observatory was designed to do that. Uh, short, short uh, story on that is that it didn't work. It turned out not to be a working method, and Vulcan isn't there because the um, the, perturb the 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 problems with the orbital calculations of Mercury turn out to be that um, the gravitational field is described better by general relativity than by Newtonian physics. And so when you look at it from the standpoint of general relativity, which of course didn't come along until after about 1915 or so, then it made sense. It explained the discrepancies in Mercury's orbit. So people stopped looking for Vulcan uh, after that. Other question? Here we go. Showing the picture of the, um, I just lost the word, uh, the lips. And said there was these bumps. Oh, with the corona. Is, is that there? flares? Uh, those are prominences, which can be associated with solar flares. This one? Yes. Yeah. Right. So these little, these little bright spots along here, those are um, places where Solar material is is fountaining up away from the 
surface. They often, if, if we had some close-ups of them, they often look like sort of arches or, or sort of, sort of uh, bridges of material. So here we're seeing them unre unresolved, but they have that sort of slight reddish uh, look there, which is the hydrogen, uh, hydrogen line, uh, H alpha uh, line that we're, that we're seeing there. So um, yeah, so that, that's the, um, you, you don't see those either. The photosphere makes those pretty hard to see as well outside of an eclipse, although you can see them with an appropriate solar filter if they're nice and bright. And they often do accompany solar flares, but not invariably. Another question. You mentioned uh, 1915 general relativity. Can you tell real quickly the story? It was 1919, right after World War I uh, got over, and uh, solar eclipse that was used to look for, uh, as a test of special relativity. Right. So Einstein himself proposed various tests for this new theory that he published in 1915. I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, and um, he said, well, uh, I can explain the thing with Mercury's orbit. But also, the gravitational field of the sun should bend light as it comes, uh, as the light passes through the, the deep part of the sun's gravitational field where it's strongest. Um, and so it ought to cause starlight, uh, the starlight that's in the vicinity of the sun to be deflected. So by the time it reaches us, that star should look like it's in the, a different position than it would be if the sun were not there. So you can map the stars six months later and see what they should look like. And then during the solar eclipse, you can map those stars and see if their shift is, is consistent with uh, Einstein, Einstein's prediction. It turns out Newtonian physics also predicts a, a deflection. And so the trick is to find out whether you see the, if your, your measurement has to be exact enough to see the deflection and see what, which, one of them is, which one of them is right. Uh, and so, yeah, so 1919, um, uh, Eddington is usually given credit for this. Uh, Arthur Eddington, um, I forget where they went. Anyway, they, they organized an expedition to take photography, <coughs> to take photographs during the, during the total eclipse and measure the um, deflection of the starlight. And uh, it was a little bit controversial. They, um, the error bars were kind of large on their, on their measurements still. So they observed deflection. They actually declared success. But there was a fair bit of debate. Not everybody was convinced. I'm, sh uh, I'm and shocked. <laughs> Uh, so it, 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 had to, it had to be done over and over again until the, the measurements were refined enough to unambiguously. So it was actually into the early 30s before it was fairly accepted that that particular observation had confirmed. Now, general relativity had been confirmed in other ways, such as the advance of uh, Mercury's perihelion and also um, uh, gravitational redshift. Um, was predicted by general relativity that if you look, say, at the light from uh, light coming from a deep, gra a deep, strong gravitational well, <clears throat> like you might have with a, on a white dwarf star, that there ought to be a redshift in the spectral lines owing to not the motion of that white dwarf star, but just uh, for the light uh, coming out of the gravitational field. That was actually fairly quickly confirmed um, as well. So those three things came along. That is the uh, advance of Mercury perihelion and the gravitational redshift, and then the deflection of starlight um, uh, were all actually predicted by Einstein, and then came that uh, and and, um, uh, and were, were um, anyway were, were well established as uh, proofs of general relativity by the by the 1930s. So I must have made a mistake by mentioning relativity, this general relativity. Oh, yeah, did special you say special? Tip. Right, I didn't yeah, catch I did. that. Yeah, it's all general relativity, yeah. Good. And you're right. Cocker again. Other questions? If not, thank you very much. My pleasure. See you next week for the as yet revealed talk uh, from Ice Cube.
Title. Yes, that'll happen tomorrow. I